growth of matter in the expanding universe. So it's color coded for density. You can see it's a bit denser here, so a supercluster will form here, a void will form here. All the, always these pictures are shown in co moving coordinates, because this is supposed to be the, the universe in the redshift of three when it was a, a quarter of the present size. So if I went to the present, what I should do is make the screen bigger by a factor of four. Okay, well, we're not going to do that, so that, that, that expansion is, is scaled out, so we just see how things develop within this box. And what you see, I'll go through this several times, even for some fix on it, there's something like that blob there. You see it falls into that, the high mass density concentrations. So material drains out of the voids into the filaments, along the filaments into the clusters. And it's that motion that's the peculiar velocities. And we can see this at work in, um, in Richard's survey. So Richard showed actually an extremely poor <laughs> rendition of this. So, um, shame on you. This, the, the <coughs> it, it was a much, a much more beautiful rendition of, of the, the 2DF Galaxy Redshift Survey, which of course is, is getting on now. The final data were, were published in 2003. But it is, well, a lot of the future activity is concentrated at higher redshifts. So, within about the redshift of 0.2, this is still the highest fidelity picture we have of the local galaxy. And the question is, can you see peculiar velocities in here? Well, you need to be educated with, with the aid of a computer as to what these look like. So let's simulate what that survey would look like if there were no peculiar velocities. That is, if, if redshift was an exact measure of distance. It looks pretty similar, doesn't it? But what we'll see is two things when I turn on the velocities. First of all, these, these supercluster filament features will move in a kind of coherent way. And secondly, embedded within them, let's say there, a rich cluster of galaxies. That's a system where internally the galaxies are all orbiting around each other. So the line of sight component velocity is random, and that will stretch it out in this, this finger of God. Probably won't happen with this one now, but somewhere in there. Ah, good. Okay, so you can see there's two distinct effects, the fingers of God, but also the, the large scale transport supercluster features. Okay? So can we measure that? Or how do we measure that? And this is, this is the slide that um, Richard showed. Let me just go through it once more slowly. You are here. Two galaxies are there. They have some separation transversely from line of sight and some radial separation. Peculiar velocities only mess up the radial separation. because It's only the radial component of the peculiar velocity that affects the, uh, the redshift. So what we measure from these surveys, the way we quantify the fact that the universe is non-uniform, is, is, is a correlation function. And what this means is you sit here and say, in a uniform universe, I should have so many neighbors within a certain distance. If I have more neighbors than that, that means things sit in clumps. So this, this number quantifies the, the excess number of pairs of the random. And we can measure it as a function of the transverse and of the radial separation. If there were no peculiar velocities, the contours of that excess probability would be circular. And they're clearly not. Well, OK. The color stuff is the data. The contours are a theoretical model superimposed to, to lead the eye. So presentation is all uh, now as it was in 1929. Nevertheless, they agree pretty well. And you can see at small separations, the finger of God stretching. But it's the fattening at large separations that's the, the signature of the the large scale peculiar velocities that slide in the sky. And we're continuing this, of course. This is now over 10 years old, if you help us. Um, here, for example, are results from a more recent Richard survey, again with the Anglo Australian Telescope. Well, now we can dissect this into different colors of galaxies. So, we're here for red galaxies, ellipticals, blue galaxies, actively star forming galaxies, more like the Milky Way. Here you see, for example, a much bigger finger of God. And this just tells you that elliptical galaxies like to live in rich clusters of galaxies, with internal <coughs> orbits, of course, larger. So this is exactly as you, as you predict. It's very nice to be able to dissect the universe into different classes of galaxies and look at the peculiar velocity field in different ways. And just to show you that we, 
upon all that as well. Anyway, for this audience, if you're not interested in, in the details of how these studies have developed, suffice it to say that by now we have of order a million redshifts subjected to this sort of study, and the, the rate of change of, of density fluctuations, which is this, this measure that allows us to probe that whether, whether gravity is correct, is accurate to something like 5%. And so we can say today that at the 5% level, the, the Newtonian gravitational constant at the scale of 10 megaparsecs is the same as it is in this room. So if you'd like to make that statement more precise, um, by 2025, perhaps, it would be interesting to have a sweepstake. Um, ESA will have launched the Euclid satellite, which is pursuing the same advantages of <coughs> low background emission that Richard was talking about. If you go to space and, and measure redshifts, it will get something like 50 million redshifts. And this statement about was Einstein right will, well, maybe he'll be wrong, but if he's right, then we'll know that to be true to 1%. So this is an example of how cosmology is, is, is going forward. We're not resting on our laurels. We're not saying the universe is expanding. We know it contains dark energy, which is a cosmological constant. End of story. We're, we're testing the properties of this apparent cosmological constant to see if it really is simple. And if it's not simple, we'll, we'll be able to say so if, if, those, if that lack of simplicity is at the one percent level. So just to sum up once again, um, the I'll give you my perspective based on going back to the data and contrasting with modern data as to whether it would have been legitimate to claim detection of expansion of the universe um, in 1929. I think even with perfect data, the answer is no. Hubble's data, as I've said, were wrong in two distinct ways. And it's the second way I've, I've never seen pointed out before. Slider, on the other hand, did everything right. He made all his velocities with correct measurements and he analyzed them with a, with a kind of virtuoso physical insight to, to obtain, I think, a very surprising and, uh, and deep conclusion, which is the detection of the peculiar velocity field of the universe. And he did this a decade before any competition at all. So as I've read his papers and, and mused on this, he's become a great scientific hero of mine. So it's been an immense privilege to come here, in particular to, to go to the Lowell Observatory, to peer through the Clark Telescope, so I wanted to say a great thank you to Mike in particular, the other organizers, and the people at Lowell that have made this possible. Thank you. Thank you, John. Uh, a lot of people who want to <laughs> well, what well, start like at that? the rear and then come to the front and then go to the middle. Uh, just a few quick comments. Slifer did need a big tel bigger telescope. What he needed was a, a filter to select emission line galaxies. This large redshift in 1913, 1100 kilometers per second, that comes from NGD 1068, emission line galaxy. So if he had a way to pre-filter out emission line galaxies, he could have seen out to 5,000 kilometers per second pretty easily. Right, but the, the, there would have been an issue of what distance those were at. Oh, that's right. He could have measured large redshifts, that's all. In terms of the 1980s confusion, remember there's this bias parameter that you can fiddle with. The mass distribution is biased with respect to the light distribution on some scale by some amplitude. So you could take raw data that gave omega 0.2 and filter that way to get one. Yeah, yeah, I, I, know, I, know, I know about bias. Yeah. Yes. Nevertheless, the claim from people like um, Deckel and Birchinger is that taking that into account, nevertheless, you could conclude, you could split the degeneracy and be sure the density of the universe was, was one. Agreed. And they were wrong. First, uh, Holman. I wanted to comment uh, about the earlier part of your paper where you said that Hubble's distances were wrong twice. Now, the uh, Shapley calibration of the Cepheids was, uh, uh, he was working with classical Cepheids, but his statistical parallax was did not have enough data in it. And he, link those onto the uh, cluster type uh, variables, uh, the RR Lyra stars. So therefore, his uh, determination of the size of the Milky Way, which was done largely with the RR Lyra stars on the body of the clusters, was uh, wrong because of not having interstellar absorption. But the problem with the 
Hubble's data was, of course, because that calibration was wrong, that was the factor of two, essentially, that Bada found uh, in the early 1950s. But you can see from the uh, Hubble constant that there's about a factor of eight between the modern value and the value he's got. So that means there's a factor of four more. That was what you said was a second correction. I discussed that some with Sandage, who said that essentially uh, Hubble and Hummison were misidentifying uh, H2 regions uh, as stars, and therefore. But, 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 but these are all Cepheid distances. But H2 regions don't vary. No, but, but the no, but you misidentified them. When you're, the when you're going region. out to, to the farther but, distances, but the what they region. thought were stars were not, yeah. and therefore uh, the extra factor of four uh, comes from this. For the 31 people with the farther distances. Hmm? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, but, but this is 1929. Yes, yes. So these are all Cepheid distances. Yeah, right? okay. And, so but, and but, as I said, the, cal the calibration is irrelevant. Because yeah. this is, if you told him, exactly to, to one part in, in a million, the distance down 31, it still have got the slope wrong by, by mm -hmm. just a factor of two or three. Yeah. Purely with Cepheids. That's, be that's because of the Cepheids, because the classical Cepheids part of Shapley's scale were wrong by uh, something around a magnitude. Still don't get it. It sounds like you're talking about the calibration. This is independent of the calibration. If you plot these well, distances how bright you think the Cepheids are. Plot these distances against longer distances. <coughs> well, that's more or less, <coughs> what, that's what, that's more or less what I'm doing. Yeah. Yeah. It's a different galaxy, so you can't do that much. Yeah. The calibration curve, as you said, was wrong, but it was not wrong because he was using uh, W virgin stars, population two stars. It was wrong just because the statistical parallax was based on the two uh, smaller data bases. <coughs> right, okay, well, thank uh, you for that. Uh, do you want to comment on that? Just on that, if I may, uh, John. Uh, first of all, if, if I understand it, and I, I think your point is very well made, and I hope you publish it, on the 1929 graph, clusters like me have been wondering about this for years. You know, It's the difference to me, put simply, between the systematic error and the random error. I've been wondering about that scattering for a long time because I have to say I don't agree with all that. I, I can't see how it's a question of calibration. I think there's a random thing there that, that I've never understood, and I think you've given an explanation for it. But well, some clarity I, I would like is I, I don't understand it. I have the paper in front of me. I, I don't, yeah, but, well, by the way, first of all, Harry's point, which came too late, <laughs> Harry's point was very important there, though. I mean, just in terms of why Hubble actually drew the line at all is, of course, the point that's not on the graph, as he says in the paper, as you know. you know. On, on the paper, what really convinces him and, and Hummerson is the point that's much further out. So I, I think that's the answer to why that line is there at all. But on the 1931 graph, where, I mean, I mean first of all, can you just show you your version of it? Isn't quite what I have in front of me. I think you've converted the x axis. No, the 1931. That's great. No, I just, yeah, no, I no, just no, grabbed that off ADX. Yeah. Okay, yeah. that's what was published. Okay, you know, in the paper. I don't quite understand why this, yeah. this white stuff yeah. is there. The x axis is in the parent magnitude on the version I have here, thanks to John Peacock. <laughs> the, the, the version I have here, it's, it's actually a parent magnitude that he shows, and then that's converted on the next page. Well, yeah. if you go to ADS and download that paper, this is what you get. Okay, so why do I have a slightly different version here? But anyway, is your point there? I mean, I, I took your point, by the way, each one of those is a mean. In, in, the, in the distance, but what, what did you say? I, I didn't understand about from his calibration from a parent magnitude to distance. He is using the, the usual method. What, what did you say is different? No, well, I said down here, <coughs> you have the 1929 data, which is yeah. Cepheid based, yeah, yeah. so you have direct, physically motivated distance indicators. Yeah. But now, out here, you're assuming individual galaxies are standard candles, which, of course, we saw even in the okay. 1924 paper, is a really dodgy assumption. Okay, we have to. Uh, it was you and then you. How does the direction of the dipole that Hubble would strike a plan compare with modern value? Well, it's different, of course. But it's That's been right. That it, that it, it, it's a dipole relevant to a shell of galaxies at the yeah. amplitude of 2,000 kilometers a second. And that shell is in long motion as well, 
which is why I think the direction doesn't agree at all with the CMB guideline. You wouldn't expect it to. Does it agree with modern values or done the same way using the same sort of shell? Well, yes, in that I've made a modern calculation of what the dipole is that fits Slifer's data for those galaxies, those redshifts, those positions on the sky, those redshifts. So well, would they have more galaxies with the same distance? We do. I mean, you, you could, but it's obviously the right order of magnitude. Okay. Yeah. Can, can I just go back to the 1917 paper by Slifer? Because I suspect if Virginia Trimble has been here based on looking at her abstract and the name she mentions in her abstract, she would have raised the issue that Truman, Young, and Harper have done the calculation about the motion of the sun with respect to the system of the spirals before Slifer. And also, I think Slifer corresponded with Paddock, GF yeah, Paddock, who also does the same calculation. Yeah, yeah, the, no, because I, did you mention that yesterday? I, I, yeah, it was the first I, time I'd learned that he wasn't the first to do the dipole, but it's, it's the interpretation. I think yeah. it's an obvious thing to do the dipole. For the people of the era. Yeah, they were always I doing this for stars. Yeah, That's the I interpretation I thought was so. Yeah, I, I haven't read the paddock paper in a long time, so I forget precisely how much detail he goes into. He's a big, and you know, this is where stellar radial velocities were. I mean, it's a great factory for stellar radial velocity. And so it may well be that the paddock has a not dissimilar interpretation because he's certainly using his calculations to argue for island universes. So I, I don't know for sure, as I say, I haven't read the paper in a long time, but I think we have to be careful uh, here because we also need to take a look at what Paddock says the year before because Slifer corresponds with Paddock and says you can't do it. So, so did, Pad did Paddock publish? Do you have a copy? 1960. <coughs> I, I don't have a copy, but I can I bet you it's not on ADS. <laughs> it is. It is. It is. It's a good paper. Well, it's a good okay. So, Thank you. you know, um, um, in 1916, Paddock had 15 radial velocities, because that's what uh, Slyther was presented in 1914. But Slyther said that's too few. But then Slyther had 25 in 1917, and then he, he feels comfortable to do the calculations himself. So there, there is a bit of history going into that 1917. The, the K correction is in there, and the, and the correction for the proper motion. Yeah. It's, it's interesting to look at the, uh, the sky distribution, because, because the impressive thing about Slifer's data is he went as far south as minus 30, which is good going for him. Okay, thank you. Thank you.